We're very lucky in the Science Museum that within the George III collection, we have the collection of a lecturer called Stephen de Mainbray, who toured the country in the mid-18th century, giving lectures on what we would now call physics. And his mechanics apparatus is obviously not nearly so grand as George III's. This is his compound lever. And if you use the levers together, that is, you put the long arm of the middle one over the short arm of the left-hand one, and the long arm of the right-hand one over the short arm of the middle one, you'll get a multiplication of the mechanical advantages. So you will be able to lift a very large weight with a very small one. He was also interested in carts, like the lovely hay cart we saw over there. This is also to do with wheels, but you can see the cart is completely different. Here we have the rolling double cone, a lovely paradox that was very popular in the mid-18th century. And although the arms are slightly lifted at this right end, the double cone will go to this end because actually its centre of gravity is lower when it's at the right-hand end than it would be at the left-hand end. Moving along down here, you can see that de Mainbray was also interested in real-life situations, and he had some model cranes. This is a lovely model rat's tail crane, as it's called, which uses all the basic mechanical um, machines. It uses, for example, the large heavy wheel at the bottom end here um, to lift a heavy weight. And the wheel was so big that men, horses, or sometimes other animals could work the wheel from inside. Or alternatively, you could turn it with a rope from the outside. This is another form of crane, which has a little roof to keep the rope dry. And it was also using the mechanical advantage of the capstan. This little machine is a scorpion. It has, works like a lever in that it has a very long tail, which is pinned down. And when it's released, the weights, the heavy weights drop, and the missile, whatever it might be, is hurled into the air. Pendulums came into mechanics um, in the dynamics section um, in the 18th century, and there was a lot of interest in pendulums because of the longitude problem and looking for a clock that would keep good time at sea. And one consideration was the fact that if it was warmer, the metal expanded and therefore the clocks ran slower. But if you used a compound pendulum with different metals in that counteracted each other, you could have a clock that would run at the same speed at any temperature. Um, to do with these compound pendulums, and this is domain brace, um, you had pyrometers in which you tested the rate of expansion or the expansion of the metal in particular temperatures. So this device here would have had a little oil bath at the bottom with little wicks inside it burning to heat the metal. And that expansion would have been communicated to this lovely dial on top. Another part of dynamics was central forces, which had obvious applications for astronomy. And one nice experiment they used to like to do was on the whirling table, i.e. the table that spun round. These tubes are designed to go on the whirling table. When they're in their normal um, static state, like here, obviously the heaviest things will be at the bottom of the tube, like lead, for example. Um, but when you whirl the tubes, what happens is, obviously, the heaviest things move outwards, and you get this paradox. And things like that, uh, like the rolling double cone and these whirling tables, were very popular in the 18th century because people would see what they wouldn't normally expect to see. This piece of apparatus is called a cometarium because it shows the path of a comet in the ellipse of the lower part of it. And you can just see written across there, Dr. de Mainbray. The upper needle simply traces out a circle, but the bottom one, the little ball there, traces out the path of the ellipse with the sun there, the golden ball at the center. And it also refers to Kepler's laws, which is equal areas being traced out in equal times. Now, camera obscura was used quite extensively in the 18th century for sketching. The light comes through the lens, is reflected by a mirror at 45 degrees, and ends up usually on a screen. Here below is an actual model of a camera obscura with string. And it seems these models weren't very well known at the time. It's a very early example of one, because de Mainbray had to describe in great detail what he wanted his models to look like. 
and you can see the original object there, the um, 45 degree mirror there, and um, how the image was going to be eventually captured on the flat top there. Um, coming down here, this is a little polemoscope, so called, or jealousy glass. It looks just like an ordinary opera glass, but you wouldn't actually be looking at what was going on on stage. You have a little mirror inside there, which was enabling you to see somebody else in the audience. Here, similarly, is a telescope um, covered in what's called chagrin, which is ray skin, um, dyed red in this case, and the green draw tube which you can see on it, again, Domain Bray and the date 1752. And here we can see some prism experiments explained by these lovely little models in ivory. Obviously, if the weather wasn't that good, you could set up these little ray diagrams with string and imitate the experiments if the sun wasn't out for you. This one here, you can see that um, light passes through a prism, is split up into many colours, goes through a lens and then a pinhole and comes out of the spectrum, this side here. Similarly there, another prism, another lens and a point of light. And this one here similarly comes in on the right hand side, goes through the prism and becomes um, a spectrum again.